What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We are live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube. We're live on Twitch. We're live on Twitter slash X. Maybe you're listening later. Spotify, Apple, Android, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's all good. And uh, this show, this is going to be a big show because this show is a game, game of chicken between me and Pete. To see whether I can trick him into not popping his beer before we start the music. Oh, or if really I start the music the and then curtain. he pops his beer. Yeah. He got it's you a, on that one. You got me this time. Although, before <laughs> you were setting me up pretty good by being like, doing the fake start, and then I would crack and the beer, and then you would start it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's fine. I the forgot beauty of chicken time. is that both nobody wins and everybody loses. <laughs> I think so. Now, here's a place where everybody wins, actually. I did want to give a shout-out right at the top of the show. Good friend of the show, Daniel Cabral. This isn't comics-related, but it is good person-related. He is running the Hartford <laughs> Marathon. Good yeah, good person club. Hartford Marathon, and he's raising money for the Sandy Hook Foundation. If you're interested in supporting him there, I believe Already he's doing contributed. It. Awesome. Uh, I believe he's doing it next month. You can go to GoFundMe, GoFund.me slash 621DD673. So once again, it's 621DD673. 621DD673. Six seven three. There you go. Now you're remembering it. I what said a nice little times. tune. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if we auto tune that and release it on TikTok, I think. Oh, finally, it'll be huge. Yeah, we, we get at least two hundred to three hundred clicks of people who are uninterested because that's how TikTok works. Oh, <laughs> are you yep. on TikTok side, Pete? Yep. Oh yep. wow, big yeah. TikTok Pete's got you. Yeah, oh, yeah. Since T-talk. you saw you guys on Pete Talk, <laughs> you guys on Pete Talk. <laughs> Hashtag Pete Talk. Anything else we want to say about that? Or no, we, we should all start just, the no, show. Well, we should let's start, start the show. The, yeah, okay, let's get a bunch going. of guests. All right, let's get into it. Uh, yeah, I was waiting so for a pause guys. there, so I thought maybe you were going to pop another Pete beer. Pete in full or shutdown mode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pete's ready to go, so why don't we go and bring in a returning guest? He has a new Woo-hoo. comic that is on Kickstarter with just hours to go at this point. The name of the book is Foul Mouth, and his name is Steve Arena. Steve, hey! welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. Hey. Uh, I, I think you have something with that, uh, saying that number to 8675309. I think you got a song there. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 It's like a very sexy, serious subject. <laughs> That's right. It's what it is. Uh, <laughs> Steve, great to have you back here. We yeah. previously had you on to talk about Slowpoke's uh, great book about Killer Sloss, and you are back with a new book called Foul Mouth, which is about a superhero yes. who gets her powers from cursing. Currently, as we're taping, you have 63 hours to go. That's right. You have major pledge goal. Woo-hoo. You were looking for $4,000. You're at 4098 right now. Um, did, are you calm now? Do you feel like you've calmed down, or are you still sweating it for those last couple of hours? Uh, for me, comics are my vacation. You know what I mean? Like, for, for my real job and everything like that, having the two months to talk to people like you and to talk to comic fans and, and indie comic creators has been just a blast. So I know a lot of people, I mean, I w- I'm not going to lie to you. I was sweating. I didn't think this one was going to get funded. I wasn't sure. Aww. I'm just, ah. I'm, very, I'm so excited uh, that we hit our funding today. Yeah. And now the, the comic is coming out. So anybody who is just interested and wants to get a copy, a physical copy, now's your chance. Awesome. That's Ooh. awesome. Now the book's about swearing. Is there any yes. truth to the rumor that you learned it by watching Pete? <laughs> I did. I, I, I mean, you guys really did your research, but but yes. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I got the idea from. I just thought to myself, I was like, "What's something I can do in comics that the big two can't do? What can DC and Marvel can't do?" I was like, "Well, cursing." I was like, "Well, there's got to be something funny there that I could do. I can't just do a book of just straight curse words because I feel like I would that be it. Like that's <laughs> that's not funny." So I thought to myself, "Well, demon, <laughs> just, demon, just curse words. Exactly, just curse words. Just." Fuck page one, shit page two. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> three pages straight. I mean, maybe maybe I'm I'd listening. sell something, but um, but yeah, I, I thought a demon possessed superhero who gets her powers from cursing. I thought that was the winner. And I, I feel probably- very seen, so thank you for making this. Uh, this is a yeah. Great by the idea. way, he means because he has been possessed by a demon. That's possessed the part by of demon. It. Yeah, Where a pizza means. eating demon. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, just. Uh, you know, I'm a big Green Lantern fan, big Venom fan growing up. So for me, I was like, well, if the curses 
you know, the more animated the curse is, the more it animates on the page, you know, maybe there's something there. So if she called somebody like a shit sandwich, the shit sandwich will appear and help and fight or fight the enemies. And I was like, that's something that's visually interesting. And that's something you could have. Yes. a lot. Of so that's that's kind of where the, the foul mouth concept came from. All right. Awesome. Idea. Uh, that's now, awesome. So smart for the medium and really just a great way to push ourselves forward in curse culture. That's mm-hmm. right. I, I feel like there needs to be a new curse word. I feel like it's been a while. Ooh, like, uh, who, uh, who gets to decide this? Like, who's the, mm-hmm. the judges' chambers of like, yes, fuck this year. You know what I mean? That's 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 the new curse word. Like, I'm, I'm wondering what the new cur- the next curse word will be. Mm. Uh, stonk. Stonk? <laughs> stonk. I don't know. Ooh, stonk. <laughs> yeah. Is that anything already? I guess I we think can that's figure the, it out. This, the GameStop, right? This the. the oh game yeah, stonk. stonk. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But you could yeah. turn the, the meaning of it into something else. Like ah. I totally stonk that. Like stonk yourself. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I it's when you <laughs> when you think you got a big win and it's actually a big loss. That's, that's good. Yourself. That's pretty good. I, I like. We it. did it. We did it. Uh, <laughs> now, before uh, we get too deep into the book or anything, I did want to mention that every week on the show, Stray Bullet, aka Brett Macris, um, is a professional chef in New Orleans, and he either curates or creates a drink for the show, sometimes based around one of the guests or the stuff they're doing. As a chef, he was very inspired by the cursing. He said, yeah, yeah. Curse, chefs curse more than anybody else. So he made a cocktail uh, based on your book. Hell let's yeah. Even, Fuck yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it's called <laughs> I, I Got a Fucking Foul Mouth, Man. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it because it's a lot of cursing in here. But Good. Oh, that's it, fun. It has, it's a delightful sounding <laughs> recipe with a charred lime that you mix with some maraschino juice mezcal tequila um give a little chili rim on it it sounds amazing i did not make it because i had like five minutes before the show (laughs) to uh, get everything together but um there you go in honor of foul mouth you got to send that to me that i'm gonna have to make it and try it yeah yeah let us know what you think yeah. It's hard unique. to find fucking tequila, but it's worth it. <laughs> and yeah. ass, ass burning chili liqueur. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, well, there you go. So uh, to get back to the book, though, just in terms of the content, in terms of the cursing, was there anything that you felt like pushed it too far? Were there any places you didn't want to go in terms um, of the language? I, I didn't want to use the C word because I just feel like I I don't know if I can <laughs> I can do that just yet. But I also feel like less is, <laughs> less is more in terms mm-hmm. of the cursing. So I, I wanted to make sure that the the comic, again, like I said before, wasn't just about cursing. It was more about using the opportune moments to curse and use it to your advantage. Because yeah. when, you, when you use language and you curse, I feel like people listen. Mm-hmm. And in the mm-hmm. comic, um, Faye Flick, the main character, is not really listened to. Like she's talked over, she's she's quiet at first, and but she uses this this power to kind of find her voice. So I had them, you know, one, one of my favorite ones is she, she says cock em, sock em robots and the, the robots come ah! up and they're penis robots and they help her fight. And I'm like, that's you could you could have so much fun. She could drop literal F-bombs um, if she needs to. So just um, love, love talking the language. I don't think there's a place that's too far. But for now, like, all right, just get my feet wet and then figuring it all out as we as we go along. I love that F-bombs. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, I also love that because you know, by your in your own words, like if you swear too much, then sometimes it loses its power, exactly, and especially your yeah. po- your fellow podcasters don't understand what you mean anymore. You know? Absolutely, and 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 also um, the original name for foul mouth was sorry, my cat is trying to enter. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. very cute. So this is Spencer. He's also in the comic. Um, yes. but, uh, swearing is catnip. It is. I mean, that's all. That's <laughs> all right. that he, he says. Um, but going back, the original title for Foulmouth was going to be Superfuck, uh, you know, with the Growlix there because her name is <laughs> Faye Flick. So I was going to make it Super Flick, but you know, you uh, mm-hmm. the, like Superfuck. But there's a comic called Superfuckers out there, so I was like, that's too close. Let's go clean with it. Let's go Foulmouth. And I thought it would be funny even to do these, uh, you know, these interviews. If I needed to do, I needed to do it clean. You know what I mean? I could do it, and and it would still be funny because it's like, all right, he's not cursing. He's not what we mm-hmm. thought he was. <laughs> He's not what we thought he was. Yeah, we thought uh, he'd be cursing. He'd be saying f bombs the whole time. That's uh, his whole I thing. Wanted, I wanted to ask you. This is not specifically about the book, and maybe sure. this is just like an oversight thing. But when I was looking at the Kickstarter, I saw your bio says, "Hi there, my name is Steve Arena, and I am an aspiring comic book creator from Norwalk, Connecticut." 
Steve, you're a comic book creator. Yeah, no longer aspiring, my friend. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to change you. that? You're going to update it? I, I think I will. Maybe I'll put some more. Fucking change it. I made a fucking drink after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you're talking like a comic book creator. I know. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah I, I, it's weird because like I'm still, I, I still think I'm brand new. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, yeah, I guess it's not aspiring anymore after, you know, five successful Kickstarters now. Thank you for everybody who backed and will back. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate it. I love the comics community. It's so welcoming and, and giving and you know i couldn't have done this without you uh we got a question here from youtube this is from anthony latch says how can i let the world know that cursing is my superpower maybe something i could wear so we have <laughs> anthony latch is a great guy he's, he's bought for me before oh on his show um i, I actually was he, he found me through this show which is even crazier oh. Oh, uh, nice. but the, we have the vaunted comic book club bump it's That's real right Bump. It is. It is real. Um, but yeah, we have uh, T-shirts and bumper stickers this time around that say "Cursing is my superpower." For those who, you know, maybe are, are not interested in the comic or just like, ah, oh, you know, I'll I'll check it out. But the shirt really sells it in. So if you're a big curse word person and uh, love to curse, and you're on the highway, cursing is my superpower. We have the shirt and the bumper sticker made by artist Jason Thomas. Oh, That's cool. a great bumper sticker. Bro. Yeah, it is. Perfect for the back of your car. Or the front or all or around the, front. the window. If you're or the all window, the way around. <laughs> if you're cutting people off, if you're, whatever you need to do, cursing is my superpower. Yeah. yeah. Now, after the 63 hours are up, at this point, what stage are you at with the comic book? Do you have the first issue done? Do you have a little yes. bit more to go? Where are you at? Yeah, the comic is done. Um, the art is done. Lettering's done. The only thing I got to do is just... Put, you know put the cover together mm -hmm. and the you know the logo on the cover but it is basically done so the minute i get the minute the kickstarter is over i'm going to make the comic uh wait until the you know everything's settled with the you know the funds and everything like that and then i will release Foulmouth immediately and i'll be getting to work to getting the comic printed and getting it into the mailbox as fast as possible i love that nice. that's great steve Steve, congratulations on congrats, everything. Uh, very you. excited that this project is successful. Really looking forward to your next one as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, congrats. The, the Look it one. on the Kickstarter and the t-shirts. <laughs> very cool. Thank you very much. The next one, I think, will be Zombie Date Night 2, as I just finished the script. So I'm very excited for that. Um, Ooh, all right. But So, you know, little by little. But I, I couldn't have done it without people like you and, and great people who love comics and, and always only want to spread positivity about comics. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Always That's good awesome. seeing you. Have a great night. Congrats on everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Later. Once again, it is called Foul Mouth. It's on Kickstarter right now. You can check it out. You can fund it as we're taping for the next 60-ish hours or so. And then after that, hopefully you'll be able to pick up Steve's next thing. Why don't we bring in our next guest here? He is the creator of the new book from Abrams, We Are Not Strangers, which came out last week, I believe, if oh, I have nice. my dates correct. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Tuninga. Josh, hey, welcome. welcome. Hello, guys. How are you? All right. Uh, thank you so, so much, much for, for having coming. me on. Oh, my gosh. Uh, before we get into the book, where are you? It looks like you're are in you a, on a ship. Yeah, yeah it looks like you're in a spaceship. What's going on? I'm. Uh, this is my studio. I, I work out of a old uh, converted school bus. So oh man! Cool. I can just pick it up and show you the outside, but yeah, that's that's what this is. How did and you actually, find the that? The paneling on top is because a tree fell on it actually right during COVID, so it kind of gave me a project to work on while during that time. So that's why it's all got wood on the top there. Wow, that's amazing! Wow, that is and awesome. it looks like you're parked right next to a spaceship. <laughs> oh, is this the light? Oh, my daughters helped me with the lights there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Uh, how did you park uh, in front of your home? It's or? kind of yeah, off the side of the property here. Um, yeah, I live out kind of in the woods, so I got some room for this. Yeah. Good for you. This I wanted awesome. to park it in the in the very front of my house, but my wife was like, "No, let's just throw that over in the side." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the right answer. Sounds exactly. about right. Uh, question from Derek Meinhart. Can you drive your studio around? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, so the guy I got it from was um, an old Burning Man hippie who that was his dream to get it running. But I had it towed here. My brother's a mechanic. He looked at the engine. He's like, no, there's no way in hell. That's <laughs> no. <laughs> Hard no. Uh, well, awesome. That is amazing. Also, your book is amazing. I was really impressed yeah. by this. I thought this was really fascinating. Uh, it just came out, as I mentioned, September 12th, right, from Abrams. So yes. 
before we even get into the plot or anything like that, what has the week since the release been like for you? Have you gotten to go to any events? Have you seen any reaction? Yeah, no, it's been really, really, really fun for me. This is my first graphic novel. Um, and the local, this is a Seattle story. So the local response has been really, really cool. Um, it's based on a true story. And there's, it's actually kind of interesting. There's a lot, been a lot, some other stories kind of coming up, uh, you know, locally mm. that are kind mm. of similar to it. So um, yeah, that's been really pretty rewarding. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a local story, but it's, um, I think anybody who has an interest in that time period and just, you know, community and stuff like that will will love it. Oh. Can you walk us through it, the story, uh, the basics, and then sort of how you discovered it as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so I heard the story from my uncle who went to his grandfather's funeral. Uh, it was a typical Jewish um, event until a handful of Japanese American guests started to arrive. Um, and nobody who knew, knew who they were or why they came. But um, so what my uncle found out is that his grandfather had helped these families when they were forced out of the neighborhood and incarcerated during World War II. Um, so that's that. I heard that story. Um, it only took him a couple of seconds to tell me, but I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, like, how does a Jewish immigrant with a family overseas still threatened by the Holocaust end up helping his Japanese American neighbors at home? Um, so yeah, so it, this the, this story is just kind of about the kind of environment that can create that remarkable relationship. I, I thought one of the things that was really fascinating about the narrative here is you're a couple of steps removed, right? Like you're already removed by the fact that you're doing a biography. So it's not about you. It's about somebody else. You're telling somebody else's story. But this is a story that was told to you by your uncle that is about your grandfather, I believe? His, his grandfather. His grandfather, yes. yeah. So uh, yeah. what is it like bringing those elements together in terms of creating a cohesive story when you have so many steps removed from the actual story itself? How do you piece it together? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I felt close to the story just because my family's from that area and I, you know, I just grew up hearing about the neighborhood and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, that was just kind of my style writing, right, process writing this because I heard that story. I started learning about other stories and I, I just kind of, every time I'd hear something, I'd weave that into my narrative and just kind of create this historical fiction based on these oral histories. Um, so yeah, that just kind of was my process. So his was the first I heard. And then, um, yeah. And every once in a while I'd meet up with, up with somebody about, oh, I could interject that little detail in a panel or some dialogue, but sometimes it would just turn into an entire new chapter. Um, so that was just kind of the process. Can you talk and how does oh, that work? Ahead, are you sorry, sorry to interrupt? There. No, no, are you sorry. meeting with these people deliberately because they have a story that is is connected, or are you just talking about your story so much that people are like, "Oh, you know, I actually have a connection there." Oh man, both happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it, like, <laughs> I mean, I heard this story and I was like, "Oh, this could be like a short, small little comic I could put in a local paper here." But as I talk to people, oh, you got to talk to this person. You got to talk to this historian at University of Washington talk to him and then it just like it just kind of grew and grew over years um yeah. and yeah i mean just and then i could like find something and find a way to interject a chapter in between the story and it just kind of like it was an interesting process because it wasn't it just kept evolving and growing from there um and i had my you know my beginning and my ending kind of bookended um so that i could kind of fill in the gaps that way but um yeah I love the way that your story, the process and the story sort of were a little bit of like finding the, a community you didn't know was there. Like that's amazing when both can be doing the same thing at the same time. Oh yeah, you mean like the community of the of the environment of the Central District? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and you, you finding all these different stories and sort of weaving them together and sure. your characters finding that they had this whole other part of their lives that were, they had never heard of until the you know, the event that tied them all together. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it turns out that's pretty common. I mean, a lot of people who like went through those hard times during, you know, the Holocaust or the inter incarceration, camp incarceration camps, you know, they didn't tell their, you know, sons and daughters and grandchildren a lot of details. They, they like wanted to protect them from that. There's a lot of reasons like to kind of like just work hard, move forward. So, you know, <laughs> there was a lot of, there was a lot of like, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know that many details. So the people who I talked to who did know, that was pretty rare. Um, and yeah. But. Uh, I, I don't know if this is eventually going to come around to a question, but I did want to mention a couple of things here that I thought were very interesting about this book for me. 
So I, I'm Ashkenazi. I'm not Sephardic. And certainly I went to Hebrew school and I went to Hebrew high school. We learned a ton about the Holocaust and we're very steeped in that. So what I thought was so fascinating about this reading this book is every couple of pages, there was a detail that was different from the majority of stories that I've heard from the very basis of uh, delving into Sephardic Judaism versus Ashkenazi Judaism, which obviously that sounds like that's your heritage. So of course that's where you're coming from, but then flipping it from a lot of these stories uh, take place or start in New York and moving it to the West coast and having it to Seattle. I also thought was really fascinating because it changes visually the setting it changes the culture and everything like justin was talking a little bit about and then that last part that you were mentioning just to be more specific about it for anybody who's listening to the podcast but so you have the main character your uncle's grandfather who is trying to get his grandmother out of the holocaust and back but instead not exactly gets distracted but as the people around him and specifically his friends and family are getting taken into Japanese internment camps after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He pivots and really starts helping them and delving into how to figure out how to save them. So anyway, this is a long way of saying that I, I was really fascinated by all of the elements that hit these stories that I've heard a million times in a very different way. I guess to come around to a question, did you have the same experience or is this like, is this the stuff that you were delved and steeped in when you were growing up? Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, well, and by the way, I have uh, Ashkenazi grandma and a Sephardic grandfather. So I've got both sides of my family. Yeah. Um, but the Sephardic side, I mean, yeah, I think that, yeah, the most people, when they think of a, of a Jewish culture, they think of matzo ball soup, speaking Yiddish, and, and that's like an Ashkenazic his, her, culture. Um, and this is Sephardic, which is Jews from Spain and Portugal and Middle East. So yeah, this is kind of, that's, and which is, I was excited about that because I I can't even think of a story that kind of highlights that as main character. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. And then, like you said, the, um, I mean, I learned, yeah, I just learned so much in ranking this book. I mean, the, the, like you said, the, um, the duality of like this guy who's got his family in the Holocaust, but then, and he has an ally with the U.S. He needs the U.S., you know, but then right right there in the midst of this, he's seeing his neighbors being put into camps, forced into camps, stripped of their rights by the U.S. So it's just like it's not so simple of just the savior story. Somebody swoops in to help. It's really complicated of the of a history. And yeah. So, yeah, all those things you asked. Yeah, I was just. I learned so much making this book, pretending like I was a journalist. It was like, it was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were a journalist. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess so. Eventually I became one. <laughs> uh, we got a journalist in a here. sick studio. Also, <laughs> got another question here from YouTube. Do you think the story speaks to our current political climate? Mm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, you know, like I said, I, work, I live out here, kind of a rural area, um, and... Yeah, I mean, not everybody here sees eye to eye on everything, uh, and so politically, you know, there's so many, there's so many, there's so much division around, you know, and so I think this story is totally a reminder that we can get back to something that doesn't have to be that way. Your neighbors don't, you know, can be trusted just because they don't disagree with you, um, and so yeah, that's a big takeaway for me. Well, and I also think maybe this is what Garrick is getting towards. It is always. Good is probably the wrong word, but worthwhile to have a reminder of the Japanese internment camps, which are, to put it lightly, a black eye on America and an absolutely horrific period in American history that in some senses is still being repeated with internment camps that we have today. So that certainly was one of my takeaways reading it, like going through that and particularly pointing out that the internment camps didn't stop when the war stopped, they went on and then those people had to somehow try to go back to their lives and their lives were already ruined. Again, these are the same things that are happening right now with uh, different people and different aspects. And it's, it's upsetting. And again, that's putting it very lightly, but absolutely. Yeah. Um, now that you have put this together, <laughs> <laughs> are, are, do you want to do something lighter next? What's your next project? Like, uh, <laughs> something, uh, something. You hit it right on the head, man. I, I've got a, a really lighthearted fiction story I'm working on. I definitely, when I finished this story, I was definitely thinking that. I was like, I need something that I can just kind of play around with because it's kind of a heavy topic. Although I will say, it up. this, this <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I will say that, you know, we're talking about these really heavy topics and, you know, I don't want to throw anybody off from reading this story just because of that, because this, it was also really important for me to write this in a way that was like somewhat of a page turner. It had some humor in it and it was kind of a fun read as well while you're kind of learning things along the way. So just want to make that point. But yeah, I, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Well, all I was going to say is also the, the art style in there, I think, really emphasizes that where it's not this moody, grim slog the entire time. You have very bright colors throughout. You have very open spaces because it's in Seattle and you have these bright blue skies everywhere in the sea. So it definitely feels like this very considerate, gentle way of hitting very serious topics is what I would say about it. Okay, good. That's good. Yeah. Well, and shout out to Avery Baker and the colorist on that. She's, yeah, They did an amazing job. Um, but yeah, future projects. Um, yeah, a, a lot of stuff in the works, but I'm not sure what I'm, what I'm going to focus on yet. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe something about like a comic book creator who drives around in a school bus and brings <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of magic. journalist yeah. school bus. I love it. Burning yeah. goes to Burning Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dream. yeah. Excellent. Ghost Josh, thank you so much for coming on. Congrats, yeah, congrats on, the on the book. book. Amazing. And, um, good luck on whatever's next. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. All right. Great to talk to you. There we go. Once again, the book is called We Are Not Strangers. It is out right now. Such a touching everywhere. Book. Great book. Abrams. Definitely Def check it out. out. And we love Abrams, folks, clearly because our next guest also <laughs> published a book through Abrams. The book is called Billy Blaster and the Robot Army from Outer Space. It has been out for about a month now, so out a while. So if you've checked it out, that's awesome. If not, we're going to talk about this great book. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lady Taylor and Jim Bart D. Bartolo. Hello, Yay! Jim and Lady. How are you? Hey, guys. Hi. Thanks for having Hi. us. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Oh, my it. gosh. Welcome. So, again, the book is called Billy Blaster of the Robot Army from Looks Outer amazing, Space. right there. It focuses on this genius character named Billy Blaster, her arch enemy, who is a tidy little kid who fights against her <laughs> the alien invasion she is stopping along with a goat and an army of robots um this book is talking so much goat. fun talking goat <laughs> there are so many uh, elements at play time. here where did it start with did it start with billy did it start with something else what was the germ it sounds like you've probably gotten this one a, a bunch oh. but well it's it's actually funny because we actually we wrote this book so long ago that it's hard to really remember uh, <laughs> really exactly how it developed yeah, because yeah. yeah like we had met in art school you know like 25 we're, years ago we're a married couple of, uh just in case oh congratulations thanks for coming yes, clean about that <laughs> <laughs> those of you watching they're in the same box they're in the same <laughs> right. so this isn't some immaculate high. like high-tech green screen no <laughs> but uh, long story short up. what's yeah, the right. nature of their relationship <laughs> <laughs> but we met in art school 25 years ago, and Jim was there because he loved comics, and I was more interested in children's books. And through the sort of synthesis of our of our loves, um, we realized that there were no comics for kids back then, back then. which was mm -hmm. wild. And so as we worked, you know, developing our careers, that was, you know, something that we were interested in doing. And it really wasn't a thing that was ready to happen yet at that time. So we did have, we had plotted out the story um, way back not 25 years ago but like 15 years ago and um and ended up putting it in a drawer uh so <laughs> it's hard to remember exactly yeah. how the idea at evolved. the time it was mostly like there was bone there was baby mouse and there was owly and to owly. mention yeah, yeah and to mention comics for kids to like mainstream publishers they were like what all you yeah. know mostly they would think uh dairu mp kid which yeah. is also with abrams how about do a hybrid book or that kind of thing? So yeah, we were like, like comics maybe... weren't real books. And also they didn't have the expertise to do them. Yeah, even there if weren't they wanted the to. art directors in house that could be able to oversee that kind of thing or the editorial, the editors hadn't really caught up to that sort of uh, skill set. So, um, but yeah. anyway, go ahead. Wow. Yeah, we knew we wanted to do something funny yeah. and bright and vivid and silly and- uh... yeah. It could not be a crossover <laughs> with your first guest uh, book. Right? Yeah. No, probably not. I was going to say, there's not a lot of crossover between any of the guests. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Going right after this. But that's, that's what we like. We cast a wide tent. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, cool. I, I feel like th this book, though, like it heightens everything always to the, the next extreme. Like, so after it, you had the idea ages ago and you would sort of developed it more recently, is that true? And were you always like, how could we make this funny, funnier, weirder, make the buildings uh, taller with more windows, things like that? <laughs> well, I, I guess, um, yeah, we we both are 
fairly silly and we there's a lot of humor in our household our daughter as well who's just turned 14 but uh um so as we were going through like the you know scripting it and everything and then the art of it uh you know began during covid basically we i had done art for it years ago a little bit of it but then kind of took it out of the drawer um at uh when we uh uh, before we approached uh publishers and sold it to abrams and um kind of going through the script again, you know, changing a few things and then doing the art was like, yeah, th- there was just so much opportunity for not having to, oh, they need to build a spaceship. I don't need to figure out how to actually build a spaceship. I'll just have them do it. You know, they need to do. Which is a lot of fun too, because both yeah. of our, our other work tends to be pretty serious, uh, more serious, even though I write fantasy, it's, it's you know, um, it's more mature <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, the yeah. logic has to be a little sounder and um, Jim's uh, his art style that you know he's worked in more is is more is more realistic and serious so I think we both really enjoy being able to do the wacky um, yeah yeah how do you do it you just do it <laughs> <laughs> it really feels like it no it, rules it, the the passion behind it is really great first off Billy's hair is glorious yeah. um, oh. You know, love the maze in the beginning. That was really cool. But what I really love about it is not only uh, is it bright and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of fun, but I also love the pacing of it. You know, you guys kind of one idea at a time. It's not like middle of action. Then we got to do a flashback and all that kind of stuff. I just creatively, it seemed like you guys were having a blast and that really came across on the pages. Um, is that just from over time kind of adding things or was that like a choice from the beginning? I mean, well, I'm going to say too how the way we work is um, probably not how most comics collaborators work. Sure. And this is like a lighter, much lighter workload for me as the writer. Um, when I write the script, uh, it's really just more like a movie script. And um, and then Jim mm. does all of that pacing uh, in his thumbnails when he's yeah. working it out. So he figures out how long everything needs to be. And, you know, uh, and so. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. So I got to figure out sort of how long a fight scene would be, how long this or that would be, and sort of a, as I was thumbnailing it out and where real- things were needed to be added in or taken out. Right. Yeah. And uh, so uh, realizing that um, maybe this interaction needs some dialogue, so I would write in some dialogue, or maybe I was like, this this really needs a joke here. Add a joke in, and you know, runs things. You know, it was always kind of a back and forth sort of thing, and by our editor as well. But uh, yeah, it was just just a sort of um, very uh, ongoing process and like filled with possibilities as far as like there was never a, you know, never a part where she was like, this scene needs to be five pages long, nine panels each page, yeah. worm's eye view, bird's eye view, that kind of thing. It's all like basically a script that uh, was, was even, some direction. Yeah, I don't even I, know how I would do that. Like, you know, he's just so much better at visualizing things. That's his you know, that's what he brings to it. So it, well, it sounds like a much more intimate version of the Marvel method where uh, the writer and artist leave room for each other, mm-hmm. except you guys are in the same house going to be like, hey, what if I just <laughs> added this little, were you calling to each other from the each other's room? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I, I, yeah. We're, we're set up, up upstairs where I'm in one of the bed, one of the bedrooms and she's in one of the bedrooms like the, uh, made into uh, our workspaces. And yeah, there's a, a little bit of that. And that's while awesome. while I was doing the art, she's working on uh, other books, and so I don't want to break her flow. I don't know if any of you guys write, uh, but there's so much of like focus that can be broken so quickly. So I would wait for her to like go by to like grab some water, and I'd be like, "Hey, what about the?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> you're questions. up. I, I got to talk to you about this. <laughs> right, right, right. So take an even bigger step back. Like you're saying, you've both had successful careers doing stuff individually. Why was this? the right time to come together on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I suppose like part of it is um, we feel like, oh, we could have done it maybe even a few years earlier mm-hmm. to be, to be you know, mm-hmm. to be candid, but like, but uh, also at the same time, uh, you know, we've both been working on other projects uh, throughout the meantime. And so this was, there was just sort of like this, we had finished with some things uh, and had this little window where we could kind of jump on um uh something so but it's certainly like now that the book's done we're, we are a little bit like why didn't we go back to this sooner because you know as parents <laughs> yeah. you know we said we have a 14 year old so basically we raised our daughter during the golden age of the kids graphic novel yeah. and it really literally was like you know we go to our comic book store and you know 14 years ago or whatever we buy or i don't even know if there were any we buy every single comic 
and graphic novel published for kids because there were so few. And then yeah. as the years have gone by, we, you know, we got to start being selective and now there are so many. And so somewhere along the line, why didn't we go, maybe, maybe we should get yeah. Billy out of the drawer, but mm -hmm. we Open were just busy drawer. and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now that you have the first one out and it's been out for a month, it, clearly it is a setup for a series. There are ongoing things that can happen. Is that something on your mind? Are you working on a second volume at all? Um, that's absolutely on our mind. Uh, we have uh, the next book sort of plotted out and, um, uh, you know, ready to kind of hit the ground running on that. It's not like for sure yet. We're, you know, just kind of uh, waiting to see how this goes. Yeah. But, um, you know, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. And what else are you working on I individually or together or otherwise? What else do you want to plug, if anything? Um, my previous novels have been uh, young adult fantasy, and my my book I've been working on for a little while is my first adult fantasy. Not that it's going to be, you know. Anyways, and that's not announced yet, so I can't really talk about that. Um, but I'm uh, I've been working on it for like four years, so. And it's amazing. Wow. I've, I've, uh, the, she hasn't finished it, but the drafts I've read of it are just incredible. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Um, and uh, I I'm, uh, can't talk about what I'm working on really either, but uh, there's one thing that I'm working on that's uh, for much older sort of, or not like not like 95 year olds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's older, hot like, right now. The Golden yeah. Bachelor, other things. Oh, totally. Got yeah. for that old uh, yeah. Other yeah. things. <laughs> Something Bachelor. else. A second then, thing. Then there's also a, a, a so we're going to an older sort of comic uh, uh like edgy, teen and yeah. adult thing and then also uh the early stages of a uh younger series or a kind of older than billy series with uh another author but i can't really talk about it so. yeah do you have uh, uh, do you have other things in the drawer like were there other things <laughs> next to billy blaster where you're like actually we could i was really thing. joking that i wish that there were a bunch more because it's like the easiest book i've ever written because like my past <laughs> self did it you know and yeah. the script, you know yeah. the script was very complete we we added a little bit we you know um add a little nuance um but for the most part it was all work for him yeah. <laughs> i had like i had like eight yes. pages of 208 pages done when we sold it so it was uh um, and she was like, you know, <laughs> like, uh, here you go. Hey, yeah, I mean, that's always uh, the, the, yeah. the, I mean, the I'll say hi when I have to get water, but otherwise, good luck. Look forward. <laughs> I have to say, too, for anyone who's listening, that like the author always gets the credit. You know, it's always the author's name that's first and or only like sometimes like we had right. a real fight to even get his name like on Amazon or whatever. Yeah. Even though like I'm part I wrote part of it too. It's like, right. it's, it's, it's like, just, yeah. yeah. So people really appreciate illustrators and no, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. For that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Well, listen, congratulations on the book. It is super fun. I uh, would love to see a sequel to it. So here's Thank hoping you. my fingers yeah. are crossed oh, as fun. well. Thank, Thank you. You guys are super so fun. Much, Thanks guys. for doing what you Thanks do. Thanks for having us. Oh, my gosh. Oh, totally. Bet. Have a great, great night. to have you. Me too. Cheers, yeah. guys. Later. All right. Once again, the book is so nice. called Billy Blaster and the Robot Army from Outer Space. It is out now from Abrams, and it is super fun. Yeah. Like they were saying, great all ages book uh very ridiculous ludicrous adventures i think like we didn't Real talk fun. about this in the interview much but if you liked nickelodeon shows in the back of the day i think it's right in the wheelhouse there yeah yeah especially like the the vibe and the art style is like is like rugrats jace <laughs> yeah like, yeah yes. Yes. doug Yes, yeah. Doug's Doug's a good one, probably. Rugrats may be a little younger, but uh, very fun. Really, definitely check it out. And we are going to move on to our next section, which is my favorite section, because you all make it up. It is your audience question. Oh, it's your favorite. Oh, nice. that's nice. I it is my favorite section, because everybody makes it up, because we get to talk to the audience. My other favorite sections for when I get to spend with you, Pete, of course. Don't worry, baby. Wait, I you still guys have you. separate... <laughs> You have separate sections. So you we have the <laughs> Pete Alex section where we just kind of hang out. Be That's while we're getting some, <laughs> yeah, while we're huh. getting some questions in here, what are you guys drinking tonight? Other than straight bullets, great drink. Uh, you know, I've got that sucking it down. Uh, oh, Pete's got another pony boy. You're becoming yeah. a real pony boy. Yeah, uh, I've got. I got a pills mafia. Go pills. Uh, Go pills, play. baby. Come out. Uh, and I tried to take most of the ingredients and make a spicy margarita here. Um, I didn't have the cherries around, but I did what I could. I did. I got as close as I could to straight Alex, drink. I think you did a great job. No, stay, don't feel bad. Stay Just golden. You didn't have the time. What's that, Pete? Stay golden, Pony Boy. 
There it is. There you go. Thank you for bringing that in. We got a couple of questions here already. Let's kick it off with Derek's question. Any thoughts on public domain versus legacy characters? So this is most likely, I would assume, spitting off the news. I don't know if people have heard this. I'll mention it here. We reported it on Comic Book Club News, our daily... Oh, man, so everybody knows about it then. Well, just in case, just in case you don't miss the Comic Book Club News, which is its own dedicated feed. It comes out five days a week, and you should really check out and subscribe. Bill Willingham, the creator of Fables, declared that Fables is public domain. Woohoo! (laughs) <laughs> well, hold on. Hold, no. Cool, cool yeah. your jet horses. All right, there. let's all start writing fables. Uh, hold on, hold Uh-oh. on, hold on. It's public so domain, I can, I can write it. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of wrinkles there. First and foremost is the way that he was describing it is that fables is creator-owned but not creator-controlled, which means, according to him, again, in a blog post that he put up, that DC publishes all previous Fables material, all of those stories. If he ever writes a future Fables story or does Fables anything, it has to be for DC. But he was saying any future or other things, he is releasing it to the public domain. He said, I can do that. I have the rights to do that. And basically called like a no backsies law on it. it. Like, I'm not even joking. That's essentially what he said in his blog post. However, DC immediately came out and gave out a very rare statement. They usually don't say anything about these things. They're like, yeah. no, Fables is ours. You cannot do that. That is not going to happen. So fight, 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 fight. The, it probably is going to be a very big fight. Part of the problem here is that public domain law and copyright law is very weird. I'm not a copyright lawyer, but even with what? like my, li- I know, what? I'm sorry, Pete. Alex, you representing several copyright cases. Yeah, exactly. Pete. Yeah, I'm, I'm losing all of them, man. Oh man, <laughs> oh, man. It's good thing you're pro line. bono. But it's very complicated, and it's not clear even to copyright lawyers. And beyond that, I would say, from my very layman's perspective on this, corporations can very easily manipulate these sort of copyright laws in a court case because they are so vague and change them and have them change because they are so vague. It often errs towards the side of the corporation. And it's very rare. That it almost feels the like the system is broken. You know, what the I system mean? is broken a little bit. Well, the other ask, thing, have there ever been, have there ever been any other like comic book related copyright issues? Over not, the a not, not a one, not one. No. no are, are you thinking of like Superman and things or like Spider-Man that? or uh, well, uh, Sp- Superman is probably the big one, which it now needs to say created by Siegel and Schuster on absolutely everything all the time because of those court cases. Batman, the same thing where we finally got uh, both names on that. Um, I feel like there was a bigger, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think they included Bob Kane sort of like as a legacy thing, but Siegel and Schuster apparently was an issue. They also just had a much more contentious relationship with DC, but Anyway, that's a long way of getting around, like, what's your guys' take on this? How do you feel about this whole issue, how it affects public domain? Well, I just trust corporations, you know what I mean? Like, corporations Mm -hmm. are always looking out for people and their best interests. So, you know, if you ask them nicely, I'm sure they'd let you... Uh, you know, right. Classic statement from Pepsi Cola Page. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, Justin? uh, Something like this, you know... The, the, these are fairy tale characters. The fables are so it's like they're technically public domain. Bill Willingham added a lot to these characters, and now he it's sure saying did. like anyone can do them. Like it feels like legally, this he probably knows that's not gonna work. And like mm-hmm. I don't know what situation where that would happen. But what I like about his statement is he's basically saying like, hey, these copyright laws. Are, are there's weakness here. We can push on these and maybe get some more power on the creative side and not let them continue to dominate something that, they, that they've they won the battle for a long time. But in a time when labor is rising, there's a ton of strikes happening right now, maybe he's saying the time. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's part of it. I also think part of it, to be frank, there's been a lot of stories that have come out or been resurfaced over the past week since he said this about Bill Wellingham, to put it lightly, being a huge asshole, like absolutely like <laughs> epic level asshole. So that's something that I think comes through here as well, is he's throwing a bit of a snit in terms of doing this. 
But as I saw somebody point out today, very rightly, both things could be true, that we do need to question why corporations have such a tight hold on copyright law and public domain, and also Bill Willingham could be an irredeemable asshole at the same time. Both of those things can be accurate. So well, I think Alex when Elton's the, when thoughts the, are not about the whole thoughts of comic book club. <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> the lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Who is the copyright lawyer here? Great uh, please raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, I also Pete, think Pete's that, the like, foggy to my Matt Murdock. <laughs> we got a couple of foggies on the podcast. <laughs> the uh, what it's I was going to say all is all the way down. Foggies all the way down. The uh, the way that this uh, the way that the pipeline is now, because back in the past, it used to be like if you wanted to get your comic book story out in the world, you had to go to a major publisher and pitch them. They would pay for it. That you would sign it all away, and then you would go in. Some of those characters now are like literally propping up major corporations. Now it's different. Now there's a ton of different paths. There's a ton of different pipes you can go on. So I think this is, asshole or not, this is definitely sort of pointing to the new ways that this works in the real world. Well, and frankly, Fables is a good argument for public domain because like you said, he took these characters that were in the puppet and created something new and interesting and fun and exciting out of it. So I don't know if Fables is the best thing to kick back to the public domain because it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to do some yeah. big bad wolf fanfic? Is that your big idea here? Yeah, but, come on. But at the I, same sorry, time. I represent, I re- represent the grandma from uh, 13th century England who first came up with that. <laughs> and we have a huge lawsuit against the willing. Right. And on the other end of the spectrum, though, you get things like Woody the Pooh goes in the public domain and people are like, great, we're going to make a slasher horror movie and it's going to be bad and nobody is going to like it. So, like, there's a lot of different things going on there, but ultimately ideas should be free, I think, and can be free and they shouldn't be propping up corporations. They should be propping up the people who make them. I think that's the main thing I would take away here. Shout to that. This is from Kevin. Favorite book starring anthropomorphic animals. We didn't get to talk about this when Jim and Lady were on, but Kevin had a lot of questions about the very seductive goat on the front cover of the book. Uh, What do you guys think? Take it easy, Kevin. (laughs) Favorite books about anthropomorphic animals, Pete? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you just said Owly. We were just talking about Owly. Oh, well, sure, one. yeah, but uh, also you know, Fables. That's another one. Oh, great, great. Yeah, I'm I'm pro animals. You know what I mean? Shouts to Stray cool, Dogs. Man. We talked to Tony Fleeks at Baltimore Comic Con, or you you two uh, Foggies did, and um, I love that book, and it's fun. <laughs> Wait, what are you in this scenario? Are you also a Foggy? Or I'm a, you... I'm a Foggy, but like maybe maybe not. you're an Electra. Like, I would say yeah, you're I mean, more like... of a Jarvis. <laughs> But we're all like servant based sidekicks. <laughs> Pretty we're much. all paralegals and butlers. Yep. Yeah, those are all those are all good answers. Uh we got one here from Facebook. This is from Josh Sinison. Is the network sitcom dead? Yes. Dun, Josh. Dun, dun. Unfortunately it's true. I would throw out uh, I was just talking about this today, like what's gonna happen? The uh the writers guild is back at the bargaining bargaining table with the AMPTP starting tomorrow. Uh, so that's a good sign. Maybe we're headed for at the end of the strike. I feel like everyone's uh, feeling the pain. Uh, the the writers and the and creators have been feeling it by being on strike, but now the studios are increasingly feeling it. I think uh, so. Th- we're maybe coming to a close. What will a post uh, post strike Hollywood be like? What's going to change? I actually think the network sitcom is going to be on the rise. I think coming back, Mm -hmm. I think people are going to want more of that regularity, shows that they can rely on, and less large swings. There's going to be fewer shows in general, I think. So I think we're going to get more sitcoms. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one of the few success stories of the past couple of years is Abbott Elementary. And to your point, Justin, Whenever the strike is over, even if it does, this round doesn't work, even if it's a couple of months down the road or something like that, people are just going to want to be like, what can we do to hit the ground running? Come on, we got to go. We got to get like more content to the pipeline. And the two things that have actually worked over the past couple of years is one, Abbott Elementary, as I just mentioned. And the other one is over the course of the strike, Suits is the biggest hit on Netflix ever. That's not yeah. a sitcom, but I think, I hope people are coming around to the idea like, Hey, these Blue Sky shows that we do 20 episodes of, people will watch those in droves. They love them. They don't need to be 10-episode prestige shows that we spend 
10 million dollars on an episode we could do 20 episodes for half that price let's do that instead so yeah uh, and it's not to yeah. say those shows are bad either like no. i think we've just in the last you know five ten years we've swung so far into like okay what's the dark arc of this comedy character and it's like oh you know what let's pull it back a little bit and we can do some of that because some of that is really good shows like barry um, the very dark ride that was a show called Ted Lasso, which you guys should check out. Oh, man. Oof, so that dark. Got crazy dark. It's crazy dark. But like, but that, that show had like a very, a big dramatic arc to it as well. We could do shows like that, but also do shows where it's just like banger comedy, simple premise, easy to describe that we're just refilling every week. Like the, all the shows we grew up on comedy wise are that. Uh, I, I, Totally agree. Okay, we got a couple more here. This is from Frederico Rosa. Do you think there is a genre that might be impossible for comics to have, and maybe any that only comics can do? Wow. Ooh. I don't know if there's anything impossible for comics to have. I feel like that's the fun of comics is they can do anything. Yeah, I mean, I think... I would throw out that uh, romance comics have were such a staple of comics for so long, and I think there it's it's hard to replicate that. I think we've seen it. Superhero companies have done that a couple times. Uh, we've seen it uh, in, in other places. We've seen recently the Tom King series, which is really good, but it also has a, a other genre on top of it. So I think that's something that comics used to be very good at, and I think just the way we tell those stories has changed a bit and now it's harder for them. Yeah. Uh, I, I can see that, but I can also see people bringing it back at some point to Pete's point. You could do anything in comics, really. Like you can do any genre. You could do absolutely anything you want. I think, you know, the perennial question that I always ask is whenever we have anybody who's doing a music comic, but, even that works. Like even having yep. audio yeah. in comics works. Like you could figure out a workaround for it. So, so no. And maybe any that only comics can do. I don't know. What do you guys think? This is something I'm thinking about lately. I feel like comics, I, TV and film have tried to do this more and more, do meta commentary where yeah. the characters are sort of breaking out. And I think it, it's working less and less in other mm -hmm. medium in media but in comics i feel like meta commentary we've been rereading scott pilgrim uh, a ton of comics deadpool do this where the character's talking right to you comics do that better than any other medium and i think they will continue to that's a great answer i, I mean, think also just oh i i was just going to say very quickly the pacing as well like we talk about this a lot, but just doing pacing from panel to panel, I, I was thinking about this off of what you're saying, that TV shows based or movies based on comics will always try to do like the panel structure and it just doesn't work on TV in the same way because you're not following it at your own pace, at the own pace of your eye. So that's something, again, that I think like just visually the way the medium works, you can't yeah. reproduce it. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it, it work in some things, but a lot of times it's a fail. I remember in the Hulk movie when they tried to have like the, the kind of the I star like the star that. wipe, but they did the kind of like panel thing. Uh, yeah, you know. I, that's the one exception though. That movie yeah. is bonkers. And it's insane. Yeah, kind of works. We should watch that again. I'd watch that again. I haven't uh, seen that in many years. Yeah, Hulk dogs, great stuff. <laughs> Hulk gets larger every time he gets angrier. Very fun. All right. This is from Stray Bullet. If Cussing gave you a superpower, superpowers, what power would you want? Ooh. Well, first off, swearing does give me superpowers. Um, which which power, Pete? Does it give you? Uh, the power of rage. It makes me feel very <laughs> rageful and makes me feel stronger. So I guess, yeah, uh, Hulk out would be a nice kind of uh, effect of the swearing would be fun. Yeah, you're like a Popeye, but swearing instead of spinning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting which one it is, but one of Jane's personalities on Doom Patrol, the one where she does like the metal sharp words. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah. I like that. Great one. call, Alex. That would be very That's fun. really good. You got one, Justin? Turning into a foggy, uh, maybe? Yeah, I got it. Turning into a, the fog? 
I feel like that's the opposite of swearing. That's like saying something like milk toast. It would be like, oh no, I'm I'm fogging oh, up. Oh no, I'm fogging up. I'm disappearing. You wouldn't like me when I'm boring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you don't also. swear, you disappear. That's interesting. That's uh, my well, secret, Matt. I'm always boring. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Stanley. And this gets back to we were just talking about this a little bit. But do you think the writers and actor strike will ever end? Will animation get a boost from the strike? My two answers there are, yes, it will end. I think, here's the trick, though. If if it ends soon, in the next month, which I think is what most people hope, that means that really Hollywood won't start back up until the new year. There'll be mm-hmm. There's a period of like working out all the deals and where stuff is sort of going to start to ramp back up. But actual production won't really be going until like the very beginning of 2024. So... The strike will end, and hopefully it ends in time for it to have a big launch to the new year, because otherwise everyone's starting to get pretty nervous. And yes, I think animation will get a boost from the strike because animation isn't covered by the um, the WGA, Uh, and you know SAG. It depends on the show. So like you can animation shows are still in progress, being developed. I know some people who are working on animated shows because you. Under the WJ rules, you technically can work on those shows. So, like, that is you're we're going to see more animation because it's going it's in the pipeline now when other shows are not. Can I mention something else that I think has gotten a really positive boost from the strike, which is 100 percent not going to continue once the strike is done. But so I work as an entertainment journalist during the day and we always get pitches from people like hey, we got the show. Hey, we got this movie. Do you want to interview these people? And it's always the stars of the movie, right? Or it's always the stars of the show or the writers of the EPs. They can't talk right now. Can't talk. So every single pitch that we get is what's called the below the line people, the behind the scenes people who are doing the props, the costumes, the sets, everything. I love it. Like those are the people that I want to talk to. Those are the crafts. Those are your people. Those are my people. But I, I do legitimately like i think that has been a fantastic uh, you get the sense that the pr agents are like trying to grasp on to whatever but at the same time great these people should be talking to talk to as much as possible they should be interviewed they're putting as much work as absolutely anybody and i love that they're being given the spotlight a little bit i hope it continues post strike i don't think it will well it's a great call because like we celebrities actors especially do the same interview 50 times. A press mm-hmm. junket is a nightmare. You can hear any yeah. celebrity actor talk about, like, they literally are just, like, mush mouth by the end of it because they're saying the same things over and over, and over again. Throw in, like, someone who worked in an interesting department that really reflected on the movie in a fun way or the TV show, whatever. That's a great story. That might actually cut through the mass of same stories that everyone's doing. Well, I'll give you a very specific example from my day job. Where, yeah, let's plug your day job. You know what well, I mean? Well, hold on. The None of the actors of One Piece could do any interviews for the Netflix show, so we didn't talk to any of them. But one of my writers talked to the guy who created the sets for the show and broke down like some of the big pirate ships, the weird pirate ships that they had, and the other sets that they had, like the iconic things from the anime series and whatever. So much more interesting to me than hearing the guy being like, Yes, when I was Luffy, my arms stretched, and that was interesting because it was very challenging. Like, this is not to slam him in any way. I'm sure he's wow. a very fun interview. Yeah, Luffy But slam. he sucks, and I hate him. Oh, my God. Come I'm on, man. I'm sorry. Journalism, no, but my journalism. point being that, like, that guy spent so much time putting together a triple-decker boat that has a bar in it to give him the time to actually talk about that thing. That's very cool. Anyway, this is a long way of saying I don't think it'll happen post-strike, but... I would love it if it does, because I love I, talking to them. I'd like to just uh, point out a takeaway, uh, one thing to talk about from what you just said is One Piece is fucking phenomenal, man. You know, mm. nice. Once you watch nice. the One Piece, you can't stop thinking about the One Piece. You know what I mean? <laughs> there it is. Uh, one more thing to throw in that. When I was working on uh, this show. The One Piece? The, uh, nope. Uh, the Boys Season 2 After Show. The first show I worked on, uh, hard COVID, shot remotely in L.A., the kind of COVID where, like, a remote camera team would go into the celebrity's home, set up the camera and then leave. And they would be like, what, how does this work? Uh, anyway, we, we got to talk to the, uh, the, the 
this uh, designer for a lot of the props for season two, and we got to talk to the dude who built the whale. A slight spoiler that blows wow. the fuck up. And man, it was such a great interview. So good. Maybe the best of the season. I love that. Cool. That is great. We got a couple of other ones here. This is from Stray Bullet. If someone did trivia, could they donate to the Sandy Hook Marathon? Absolutely. Sounds like Stray Bullet is doing trivia for us this time. Um, let's see what else we got. This is from Derek. Other than cursing, what everyday activity do you wish gave you superpowers? Podcasting. <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be very we'd be strong. So powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, you got one? Everyday activity. Uh, oh, man, screaming at my brother, um, yelling at his children. No, no. You sound like you'd have a, you'd be a villain. villain. Yeah, yeah. Villain. Or maybe uh, getting angry at traffic. I don't know. Oh, that's a fun one. Yeah. I guess mine would be everyday activity would be not sleeping. I wish Ooh, that gave me super bad. Yeah, the more not sleep you got, the stronger oh you my became. God. I'd be insane. Uh, we got a couple here. <laughs> this is from Comics with My Kids. I'm not familiar with One Piece. Do you know if the sequel will be called Two Piece? Pete, any info there? Uh, there is going to be season two of One Piece, but it's just going to be called season two. So buckle up, mateys. It's, and this, uh, it's coming. This is a show about a bathing suit? No. Oh, no. It's about a treasure, my friend. The One Piece treasure. Mm. Great. Uh, well, cool. To... Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. And we got one more here. Uh, again, from this is from Comics with My Kids. Is sucking on a cheesesteak <laughs> a superpower? Of course it is. We should explain this. This is something, a sounder we haven't used in a very... Like Dramatic it. pause. Steak. Sucking on a cheesesteak. Sucking on a cheese steak. Yeah, I think we got it. I think we got <laughs> it. Sucking on a ex- cheese steak. You're, guys, we have to explain what that means because that sounds very insane out of nowhere. <laughs> uh sure so on our riverdale podcast riverdale after dark i think this was for the season three finale maybe we did was it season it was when four? it was it was during covid pete moved to philly mm-hmm. yeah right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and he began was addicted cheese to cheesesteaks yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, what a time capsule for our lives this is. yeah put on a ton of weight eating cheesesteaks we did to try a, every kind Live after show for the se- I again, I think it was the season three finale, might have been season four. Um, and Justin and I ordered a bunch of cabios of Riverdale stars who were on there for Pete, including Natalie Bolt, who plays Penelope Blossom. Uh, was it also yes. Kerr Smith, who plays Mr. Honey? Uh-huh. Um, uh, yep. Mr. Honey, was it just Mr. Hun- Principal Honey? I believe. Yeah, Principal I, Honey something. Yeah, it was Honey something. Yeah. Uh, and then also Lachlan Monroe, who plays Hal Cooper slash the Black Hood. And one of the things that we said is that Pete loves cheesesteaks. And so what he said was... Sucking on a cheesesteak. Oh, boy. <laughs> Specifically, I hope you're having a good time sucking on a cheesesteak in Philadelphia is, I think, the full yeah. phrase. You guys thought that was the funniest thing you've ever heard. Oh it's very God. funny. What a great choice of words for someone who's like, I know what these people want. Sucking on a cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it all the time, constantly. Oh, man. I know. It's uh, good times. And that is it for your audience questions. Yeah. All right. We are going to go to our next section, which is trivia. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete LePage. All right, this is the part we give back to you, the lovely audience. It's an opportunity to win twenty-five free dollars in Midtown Comics. But what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have Stray Bullets come in, and he'll play for the Sandy Hook. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So today's trivia is hopefully different news than the Zelda news, with a special nod to the legend. Jimmy Buffett, R.I.P. No, it's okay. Everybody knows we have two news podcasts. One news podcast is Comic Book Club News, our daily news podcast, and the other one is Trivia. That's right. Yeah. Trivia, trivia used to be <laughs> the one news source, but now... You know what uh, we should do? I no, should stop doing the daily thing. thing and just clip out your trivia section That's and right. post that as Comic Book Club News. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Well, Jimmy Buffett... Sucking on a cheeseburger in paradise over here. Uh, rest in peace. Come on, man. Be cool. Be cool. Be cool. All right. 
Stray bullies, on a cheese all right, burger, yeah. and paradise. Okay. All right. <laughs> Please listen to all three options before making your selection, Stray Bullies. I hope you are ready. All right, here we go. Question number one. What horror movie is being turned into a staged play? Is it A, Paranoia, Paranormal Activity, B, Barney Kills the Children, or C, George Lucas? Hmm. You're talking about the uh, James Tynan book, Barney's Killing the Children. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was that's also another telling. triumph for public domain, I would say. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Stray Bull is correct. It is a paranormal wow. activity. And Zalbin, did I pick something that you didn't talk about on the news? No, that's not comic book news. So. Yeah, all right, great. I'm doing it. All right, here we go. Army of Darkness is getting... Wait, I'm sorry. Is your trivia going to become both not comic book news and also... I'm celebrity? trying to talk about something that you don't talk about, but you do a new talk show Talk about every whatever day. you want, man. I'm trying to find his face. I'm he's trying to find it. You know what I mean? The people I hate, want I new hate items. Alex Quiz. <laughs> secret I hate Alex Quiz. <laughs> All right, here we go. Army of Darkness is getting a comic called Blank. Is it A, Army of Darkness Forever, B, G, Larry, glad you could make it, or C, G, Larry Butler? I will mention we did talk about whatever this comics is with Philip Kennedy Johnson at Baltimore Comic Con. We had a half hour talk with him that went up in the comic book club feed earlier today. So definitely check that out. Always great catching up with him. Uh, and he has some uh, great such stuff. Such a good interview. Such oh, yeah. good stuff to say about this book. Stray Bully is correct. It is A. All right. Here we go. Um, question number three. Reservation Dogs is getting props for blank. Is it A, how it reps Oklahoma, B, man, Glenn sure went far, or C, Glenn Close? Mm. <laughs> Why is Reservation Dogs in our comic book club quiz? Uh, because it's a cool show that I love very much and I consider it nerdy. Mm. I, ha I hate that I already had a problem with trivia and it's now it got even farther for the mission statement of the show. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. Yes, you are correct. A uh, is uh, correct again. Stray Bull is well done. All uh, A's. Uh, well, congratulations. We are going to do 25 bucks to the uh, GoFundMe. Wanted to make sure what it was that Daniel Cabral yeah. is doing. For the Sandy Hawk Foundation, we will donate it in your name, Stray Bullet. What is the secret Jimmy Buffett movie? That you're teasing, Pete. Okay, uh, I'm talking about the 1991 Robin Williams movie, Hook. Um, also, I uh, found out a fun fact about the movie, Hook. Did you know that Carrie Fisher and George Lucas kiss on a bridge in this movie? I did not know that. It's a fun fact. What? What? Yeah. Wait, Jimmy Buffett's in Hook? That's right, he is. <laughs> Everything you just said sounds insane. Yeah, I don't know if any of that's... True. Check out I Hook, man. That. It's crazier than you thought it was. Yeah, I don't like Which that. is saying a lot. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to be saying a lot about this week's comics because this is a huge week for comics. Tons of stuff Hooch. coming out. Huge. Oh, boy. Pete, what are you looking forward to that's coming out this week? Oh, my God, so much. But uh, something uh, that I'm really excited to talk to you guys about is Something is Killing the Children, number 33. Hmm. Interesting. Justin, what about you? I got to give a shout out to The Lonesome Hunters, The Wolf Child number. Two. Yes, dude! Wow. Yeah! This series from Dark Horse. This is the second volume uh, continuing on. One of the got great, me in the feels, this one. Got oh. a very great emotional Ooh. story, Ooh, great magic emotional. story, great Ooh, unlikely oh, partnership so story. Beautifully oh, drawn. Sort of, it's, uh, if you like Hellboy, it's not as like comedy driven as Hellboy. But it definitely is in the sort of occult universe with some great characters. And the art style is reminiscent. So, as I mentioned, this is a huge week for comics. The big you ones did mention that, that, out that I'm very excited to check out. Wonder Woman, number one, from DC Comics, oh. which is already out. We also got Captain America, number one, from Marvel, now written oh. by J. Michael Ooh. Straczynski, coming back to Marvel. So that's exciting. Rare Flavors, number one, from Ram V and Felipe uh, Andrade, yeah. the team behind The Many Deaths of Layla Starr. 
one of the best books of the past couple of years. So lots of hype on that. But there's even more stuff coming out. Predator versus Wolverine is coming out, which oh is going to be wild. Those guys have been needing to fight. What, oh, oh my God. God. Turns we're out really they've been coming? battling through time. All right, well, don't spoil not, anything. Don't spoil Not Terra anything. number 16? How about not, that? Yeah, the oh, wraps end, up, dude. The uh, end of Noctera. Uh, and I'll also give a shout out to Uncanny Spider Man number one. Uh, which go is, fuck yeah. yourself for bringing that up. Hold on. Which what? is so weird. Well, we haven't read it yet because it comes out tomorrow, right, Pete? It comes out tomorrow, Pepsi. Yeah, Code. so Just I don't know. Second. Anyway, I'm very it's intrigued. It's so stonky it. about it, Pete. Boo. It's so stonky. Don't bring up bullshit. And we'll say just for sake of argument, all of those things are going to be on our Stack podcast that gets posted Wednesday, 9 a.m. in the Comic Book Club feed and its own dedicated Stack feed. And folks, that is it for this week's show. A bunch of people we want to thank. We want to thank Steve Arena for coming on to talk yeah. about Foul Mouth. Check yes. that out on Kickstarter. Also, Josh Tuninga for We Are Not Strangers, which is out now from Abrams. Also, Lady Taylor and yes. Jim DiBartolo. Billy Blaster and the Robot Army from Outer Space is out now. Next week on the show, yes. Jared Keen, PhD, is going to be here to talk about Hammer Ooh. of the Dogs. And Patrick McDonald is going to be here to talk about the superhero's journey. Bunch of podcasts on our end to plug. Scott Pilgrim versus the podcast. We are making oh, our way yeah. whoop, whoop, through the individual volumes of Scott Pilgrim leading up to the new Netflix show. Comic Book Club News, as we mentioned, comes out every day of the week. Three to five minutes. Easily digestible news topics. Not uh, conflicting with trivia, so, which is now so about TV shows or whatever. Yeah, because everybody's you've taken all the news. Oh, okay. Sons, not, there's no, works. I'm not taking it. It's free for everybody. Sons of a Gun, our DC podcast, Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. To support this show and all the shows we do, don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Android, Spotify, or the app of your choice at Comic Book Live on Twitter slash X, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram or TikTok, Comic Book Club Live.com. For this podcast and many more, until next time, good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. See you next week. Good night.